it's driven by f great entrepreneurs that are able to scale up and, and build sustainable organizations. Great, thank you so much, Shan, for that. Charlie, you've written books uh, in conjunction with the Rockefeller Foundation on impact investing. Um, I know that the laws are very different here in India in terms of the ability for one to provide blended capital. Um, but, but instead of going into the regulatory aspects, I think I, I'd love to hear a little bit more about why is there a need to look at different models of financing mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the impact you've seen through your investments in India mm -hmm. uh, versus just one sort of investment model versus a grant-based model? Great, um, I, I'm happy to, to do this. Um, so when you think about uh, a sector like microfinancing, it would never have gotten off the ground without philanthropic capital. And you might disagree with where it ended up with, uh, the top segment being really interesting to commercial investors, but the fact of the matter is that it required philanthropic capital to start out with. It moved into more social capital and subsidies, and now you have three tiers of investments for impact investors who have different return expectations with respect to impact versus um, financial return. And there's no right or wrong answer, it's just one example where a mature industry developed that enables different investors with different blended return expectations to get what they like. Impact investors have one demand on their investments and one demand only that the investments that they make demonstrably and measurably have a positive environmental or social impact. We do not judge each other's impact, that's not what we are about, but we support each other's, you know, if, if you want to support and collaborate and syndicate, that's what these modern networks are all about. These modern networks, global networks, that leverage the regional capacity as well, turn the investment angel industry on its head. Conventional angel networks only invest in the vicinity of where they operate, within 30 miles, because they need to touch the investments, need to you know, support them, etc. What we're trying to do with this global network is actually by having radical transparency of due diligence, radical cooperation, if you wish, between all the players in sharing data, enabling syndication of people who care all over, the, all over the world with money to syndicate that and deploy it into India and other continents and subcontinents. So many of the TONIC members actually care about blended investments because we have foundations as, as, as members, we have high net worth individuals as members, and we have small institutional capital as members. Examples of blended capital um, I just mentioned that whole industry, but if you look at social enterprises that do not provide the value creation that equity investors demand in order to invest, so they do not have access to equity capital, and or they do not have the cash flow or the collateral to get access to a bank loan yet, what options do they actually have? The option that they have is actually grant capital, philanthropic capital. And we invest particularly in social enterprises who have a ramp where we can say, if we give them a grant to get going, we will help them over time get access to other money streams that will enable them to have a bigger impact over time. Horizontal blend. A great example is one of the graduates of DSI uh, uh, is SMV Wheels, for instance. They are not ready for commercial capital by any stretch of the imagination but it's a very important business model that enables rickshaw drivers that are the poorest of the poor in India to over time actually own the rickshaws that they have and have a more decent income and livelihood. We believe that we can help them over time get access to commercial capital or SEMA commercial capital. A great way of leveraging your grants over time to have a bigger impact. Just one more example because it's two different examples that I wanna really um, share with you is what we sometimes refer to as vertical blending, where different money streams come in at a point in time to have a bigger impact than grants only or commercial investments only. I've had the privilege to work with an DSI alum called Neelam Chibber, a great entrepreneur, 
and uh, on industry private limited and industry foundation. Neelam is a designer by trade and she wanted to enable tens of thousands of rural producers in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods in southern India uh, to actually produce something that can be distributed in for-profit distribution channels. Now think about the challenge of that particular notion to tie in people who normally are not producing something that uh, you can just feed into a distribution channel. So the capacity building of the producers, the design consulting, to tell them, to show them what designs actually sell in, 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 in the malls and retail channels and wholesale channels. The quality control that's necessary in order to really feed these, pr these products into a for-profit distribution channel have to be subsidized. There's no for-profit model that would enable these producers to produce something that by default would be sold in the retail and wholesale and internet channels uh, of the world. At the same time, the distribution channels cannot be not-for-profit. There's very few not-for-profit distribution channels that ever got to global scale. And therefore, you don't want to uh, make them not-for-profit, but to use the for-profit channels like the retail cha uh, channel that Neelam built with Mother Earth, right, uh, to actually uh, pr uh, distribute these products into the mainstream uh, consumers. So the point being that the for-profit investment alone without the not-for-profit grant would not tie these two togethers, together and the grant without tying it into the for-profit distribution channel would be a waste of your philanthropic capital because it would not be sustainable. So two great examples of horizontal blend and vertical blend in India that we want to templatize, so to speak, teach to these new entrepreneurs as part of DSI program and then go to scale. Thank you so much, Charlie. Those are excellent examples, and I think more so a demonstration that investors sitting in Europe and the U.S. can fund companies in Bangalore and in Varanasi and actually help them reach that scale and sustainability. Aditi, you wrote an article last year in Alliance magazine talking about the need for a philanthropist to talk about philanthropy. And I'd love to sort of have you, A, explain why that's necessary, and B, compare and contrast it with what Bill Gates and Warren Buffett have been trying to do, both in the US as well as globally. Um, I, think, I think people need to talk more about it because I feel philanthropists out there don't really know uh, what there is and that there, that there is a lot of research done in this area. I think people feel good in giving. Uh, I think everyone has good intentions. Sometimes people may not follow up. And then sometimes I feel that if, if you give um, and, don't, and don't follow up, you're not holding anyone accountable. Uh, people are not going to get more professional. And I feel resources will then get fragmented and there won't be any huge impact. So coming back to the point of uh, talking has to do with a lot of education. Uh, but in addition to education, I think we all need models who can stand up there and say, you know, I give here and I gave there. And if it's credible models who can do that, I think people get faith in those NGOs and, and it's a sort of strong backing and you'll have others come in. I think it's the same as sort of private equity. Um, and I think a lot of people here in the room would agree, you know, who are in that, in, in, um, in that industry, uh, that if, if some really big group like Carlyle or Blackstone uh, backed, uh, you know, a company, people get some sort of faith in that and then maybe you know, people give more money to that, even if it's in smaller amounts. Uh, I was talking to a foundation that's in the audience, um, and they said that that's exactly what they do. They are the first ones, they do their research, uh, they give money to a deserving NGO, and then you have many people on the back of that come in. And I think that's important to do. Great, thank you, Aditi. So it's interesting just because I think, in general, as philanthropists, we think the more we talk about it, it's bringing more of an individualistic approach to giving. But I think you proved the point, as, as, as Jayanth has talked about and, and Charlie has talked about, that it's really in talking about it, you're creating these communities, you're creating these networks, and you're actually bringing more people to the table as opposed to saying, this is what I do. It's saying, this is what we all can do together. With, with that, I'd like to open it up to, to the audience for questions. Uh, we have two mics, I, I believe, uh, one at the back of the room and one in the sort of the front of the room. So if you could just raise your hand and introduce yourself and then ask your question, that would be great. I think there's a question right here in the front. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Natalie Pinon. I'm from the Charities Aid Foundation. Um, Charlie, thank you for making that distinction between vertical and, and horizontal investing. I guess a question to, the, to, to you and to the wider panel is, if we look at um, strategic philanthropy markets in other, in other parts of the world and venture philanthropy markets and how they've grown and built over time, one of the most important things and one of the reasons why they're, they're actually scaling up uh, rapidly is because investors are very clear about where they sit on that spectrum and what kind of capital they bring to the market. How important do you think it is for Indian philanthropists to be very clear about where they sit? Or do you think that they can sort of service the whole spectrum at the same time? What we have seen, uh, particularly in North America and in Europe so far, is um, that, that there's different constituencies. The constituencies who have actually all three types of capital available are usually high net worth individuals and families that have high net worth. And they might have a, a foundation associated with uh, their family, but they also, the principals, might have other money streams available to do um, you know, sub whatever subsidy, subsidized types of investments for a limited portion of their portfolio, right? In order not to take too much risk, and they have commercial interests as well. So that's, uh, that may be in the tonic network, it's about one half of our membership falls into this category. They are very valuable and there's, I'm sure there's many, many families represented here that would have that capacity to actually blend capital from within the same family context. That's the most powerful uh, member because they don't, they can actually mix and match according to the needs as opposed to uh, having to report only to one board, one type of board or one type of uh, return expectation. Uh, if you're a foundation, in the US, there's a big movement of impact investing and PRI investing, permanent program related investments out of the foundation world as well. So even if you're only a foundation, in the US, uh, there is actually uh, a nascent movement to use the corpus of your foundation to align with the giving of the foundation as well. Now, that's more difficult for larger foundations to actually accomplish because usually there's a little bit of a wall between the investment side and the giving side. These walls are being debated and partially broken down, not fully because there's fiduciary responsibility, but there's also the desire to align your investments with the values and the impact of the foundation. Omedia Network is a great example, and Pierre was one of the leaders actually in, in the US to, 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 to move that forward. Any of the panelists, Janet, would you like to add, or Aditi? Akhil? Uh, Akhil Shahani from uh, Kaizen Education Fund and uh, the Shahani Trust. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, these classic Indian uh, family trust is that uh, very often the, uh, the, uh, the donor, the philanthropist, wants to run the trust themselves. They don't want to really build up administrative capacity within the trust. They don't want to hire the external managers to manage uh, the trust. So what is very often the impact of that trust not so obvious. Uh, I notice a lot of the international trusts tend to be, uh, you actually have very professional managers like yourselves in the Omidyar network. Uh, I'm just curious is that how would you uh, convince, maybe Dasra for example, how would you convince, let's say the classic Indian trust to sort of start moving to a more professional uh, uh, way of working and of course adding the administrative costs to their uh, donations? Actually, Jayanth wrote an article uh, in Business India uh, along those lines. Chant, if you can maybe talk about this, that'd be fantastic. No, I think uh, you're raising again a very important point for the evolution of philanthropy in India. I think it's uh, simply a matter of time. Uh, philanthropy in India, of course, has evolved uh, over the last 100 years. I mean, the Tata Trusts and so on got started a long time ago uh, and, of course, have been professionally managed for a very long time. Uh, we have, uh, as time has gone on, and other large sort of uh, foundations have been established, they are being professionally managed, whether it's the Premji Foundation or the uh, Shivnada Foundation and so on. So I think it's just a natural evolution that begins to happen as uh, trusts become larger, foundations become larger, they get involved in a variety of different activities, and most of the people who are setting up these foundations are very accomplished and very capable business people, 
and they are very results oriented and, and they want to see impact and they know just from the work that they've done their whole lives that you can only do that when you have the talent and the organization and the processes in place. And so I think that's a very natural evolution that's beginning to happen. And certainly in the US and elsewhere, obviously the philanthropic sector itself uh, is very well developed and you know uh, you have lots of people there there's a, there's a sort of entire industry if you will that's gotten built up and i think what's kind of what's going to happen in india is that similarly over time we will also build quote unquote an industry uh, uh, in in that sense again if you just think of it from the point of view of indian capital markets indian capital markets only in the last decade or so have really created that level of wealth where you have a number of billionaires in India and or centi-millionaires who can really think at that level and incur those kinds of costs. So I think it's just a natural evolution. I think uh, people are similarly inclined, they're similarly professional and, uh, and practical in their approach and, and they'll build these great organizations as well. Aditi, I'd love to get your feedback on this as well. Yeah, um, I think one thing, I agree with everything Jen said, and I think it's an evolution process, and I, we already see the evolution happening. You mentioned trusts. I'm seeing the word foundations coming up a lot now in the paper and, and, and the new philanthropists that are thinking of things. Um, I also feel they will, it'll evolve even further as people move away from infrastructure into giving to third parties or giving to uh, ways that can improve existing infrastructure. And I think we're seeing that also. Uh, for example, even in the Azim Premji Foundation. Sorry. And, um, and, and, I'm, uh, and I'm seeing that also because professional, so it's not just foundations that are coming up. There are a lot of professionals uh, in India, in Bom I'm even seeing that a lot in Bombay, that want to actually give money without maybe starting a foundation. So we're seeing a huge um, evolution of this happening, and eventually I think it will just be more professional. Jayant, if you'd like to add. No. I think Aditi is exactly right. I mean, and what we've seen as we've looked at philanthropy in India is that there are at least uh, three or four different models of philanthropy uh, in India that coexist as they do elsewhere in the world also. Uh, and th the first model of philanthropy is, you know, the very traditional Indian style of philanthropy, which is really personal charity, if you will, right, which is to your temple or to your hospital, you literally write a check, and that's that's one model of, of philanthropy. A second model of philanthropy is what you were pointing out, where uh, you know the, the, some wealthy benefactor basically creates a hospital or a temple or a school or whatever it is. There is a board that gets established, but the board and, and the organization is fundamentally controlled by that benefactor. And that's the next model of philanthropy. And a lot of philanthropy that happened in India when temples, you know, the Birla temples or the Tata hospitals and so on that got created was set up in that fashion where, you know, the, the, the benefactor really controlled the trust that ran uh, that uh, particular institution. And so that was sort of the second model of philanthropy, which you see all around us in India. The third model of philanthropy, uh, which is you know, where a lot of the philanthropy is in the US and, and now, uh, you know, evolving in India as well, uh, is the foundation model that Aditi just spoke about, where there's a professional organization, there are areas, whether it is malnutrition, whether it is public health, whether it is education, where people get involved and they work with, uh, uh, with organizations and write grants to them. So they're not really controlling that institution. They're a grant-making institution and they're professional and they're trying to help the nonprofits be successful. And then there's the fourth model, which in a way Omidya Network represents and Charlie and others represent, where they're really th 